Welcome to After the Bell on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network and the Sherdog Radio Network. I'm your host for the evening, Ben Duffy, and with me is Davidson Baker. He is a writer for Fan Sided MMA, the MMA Power Hour, and MMA Prospects, and he is the host of The Bottom Line and the weekly breakdown show on the Loudmouth Podcast Network. How are you doing, Davidson? A little tired, but always happy to be here. Always a pleasure to be a on this ride along my friend how are you i'm doing really well i appreciate your willingness to step up and uh kind of give us your thoughts on the ufc vegas 7 or ufc on espn 15 card and do you see, do you have any enjoyment in number in these uh, events like numbering up like now that we're at ufc vegas 7 and because you have a little bit of like a dreary sound every time you say it i'm the same way it's it's dreary it drives me crazy because uh, at SureDog, we call it UFC on ESPN 15. Out on Twitter, the UFC wants us to call it UFC Vegas 7, as if they've only ever put on seven shows in Vegas. It's just the most <laughs> arbitrary thing ever. And then if you go over to a site like Best Fight Odds, they're calling it UFC on ESPN plus 38, or you know, and then Google calls it UFC Fight Night Munoz versus Edgar. It's a complete nightmare. Like yeah. it's the same event and. Just everyone wants to call it by a different name. Everybody does. You know, it's like UFC Fight Night Munoz first, Edgar on some, and then you have the ESPN Plus people and Fight Night. People. Yeah, no, it's an absolute mess. I agree. Uh, so something so that, is the shaping up of this card, I would say. Uh, the shaping up of this card, which included a two fights being uh, chucked and one being made out of their wreckage at the weigh-ins, basically. And by the time all the dust settled, we were down to a nine-fight card, which would be totally fine with me if they didn't still try to fill up the time slot of a 12-fight card and just fill it in between with bullshit. Oh, but you know that's what they're going to do every time. Which is unfortunate, you know? They're, <laughs> that they, Well, it's not even like, okay, we have to give two fights to Facebook and two fights to Fight Pass and three fights to ESPN like yeah. they had to a few years ago. This all streamed on ESPN uh, continuously, so instead of starting an hour later, ending an hour earlier, or some combination of the two, they just stretched it out, and just more talking, more commercials, more... You've got to fill that precious adver advertiser money time, man. Which, that's fine, I guess, <laughs> but as someone who who does this professionally and i'm not going to be like oh woe is me because i know that most people listening are like oh dude it would, it would be a dream to to make money for covering mma but it feels like work at the end of a shift especially when you have to give it your constant attention and you don't know if this commercial break is even long enough to go up and like take a piss or like pour a drink yeah and you never know but sometimes you have to time it with the right fight too right like you have to be like you know you put the right fight up to align with that you know we're not going to mention any names and you're not going <laughs> to potentially point towards this card but you know but. sometimes you kind of gauge it like oh i want to sit down whenever this fights up you know what i'm saying like i said no names are going to be mentioned well not yet i'm sure we'll get to them <laughs> uh the Nine fights that limped across the finish line gave us plenty to talk about. We had some controversy. We had a couple of major upsets, including, numerically at least, the biggest upset in UFC history, just speaking strictly in terms of the betting odds. So uh, plenty to dig into, starting with a little bit of controversy. In the main event, Frankie Edgar, former UFC lightweight champ, former uh, multi-time featherweight title challenger made his bantamweight debut taking on eternal contender pedro munoz edgar edged out munoz by split decision and i'm not going to say it was a robbery every decision i disagree with is not a robbery but you no way but there was right cer certainly there was some dissension out there after the yeah. result was announced let's start right off the ground how did you score the fight 48-47 for Pedro. Um, I had the fight for Munoz, but it, it's one of those where I think, you know, Dana said it in the post-fight presser. Um, it was the second most alluring thing that he said in the post-fight press conference outside <laughs> of, you know, it, it, the spiel about uh, Oscar De La Hoya and cocaine. Uh, as true as true as that was, 
Um, I think the second most amount of truth he put in packed into one statement was where he said, you know, either guy could have won this fight 48, 47 unanimously and I wouldn't have been upset. And I think that's largely how the fight played out. Um, I thought rounds, particularly rounds two through four were really close uh, or rounds three through five rather were really close. I thought round one was close as well, but I was comfortable enough giving it to Munoz, um, you know he, you know how Munoz fights most of the time, and, and where he was unsuccessful in the Aljamain Sterling fight, I thought he was successful in certain areas against Frankie. You know he likes to lull you in at times, and while Frankie was doing a good job of countering off of that, like in say round two, because I gave Frankie rounds two and five, um, and I gave uh, Pedro rounds one, three, and four. I thought in rounds two and five, I thought Frankie was doing the best in as far as his collective body of work countering off of that you know aforementioned attempt to lull him to sleep by pedro munoz um the lead leg kicks were landing for pedro all night too i thought also um real quick i'd like to point out as well that frankie's durability i think was a big question mark coming into this fight and i thought it held up pretty obviously pretty well um i thought it held up perfectly well i uh, i i think so as well you mentioned the leg kicks for munoz i was going to ask you what if there was anything you think Munoz could have done to make it unambiguously a win for him? But you kind of put it out there for me because the one round that nobody is disputing that Edgar won is the second round, and yeah. that's the one where Munoz really kind of laid off the leg kicks. Yeah, that is, I mean, absolutely. And it's a round, I think, where Edgar was most potent with finding his shots and also, I mean, most precise in with within his accuracy and also, you know, doing a lot of what makes his game his game, like just landing and moving, landing and moving, like coming out, coming back in and picking his shots and getting out, resetting. And that's really what Frankie Edgar's make a whole career out of almost. Uh, he really has uh, really across now three weight classes, uh, 26, 27 fights, 13 years. The dude has looked the same uh, and fought like basically a slightly refined version of the same fighter that whole time. He is remarkable. It, it is remarkable. And remarkable was the word that I used in live tweeting the event for sure dog, where about halfway through the third round, I said, Frankie Edgar win or lose this fight looks like a top 10 Bantamweight right now. And that is remarkable. It is remarkable, and I think that it hits home with a lot of people, especially like the hardcores. Like, you know, a lot of people I think felt good with Frankie winning the fight. You know, obviously a lot of people felt, you know, a little bit sorry for Pedro because a lot of people felt as though he probably won. I think on MMA decisions, only four people gave the fight to Frankie, and a lot more people gave the fight to Pedro. Yeah. So you have that aspect of it, but at the end of the day, I mean, it, you'd have to imagine when the rankings come out and none of these podcasts that I ever do or you and I ever do are ever seminars about the UFC rankings and what's right and what's wrong about those. We could spend an entire day talking about that. However, at the end of the day, Frankie Edgar is probably and rightfully so at this point going to be ranked in the top five at 135 pounds. And that makes for a lot of interesting headway uh, for certain storylines going into the future. It does. Uh, might as well jump right onto that track. What do you do with Frankie Edgar next? It's tough. Um, and the best part about it, especially when you get these guys that, you know, like you said, what, what is he? The 10th or 11th, or maybe I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. How, how many guys have won fights in three different weight classes? Like, I mean, he, he's one of them. Connor's one of them. He is, uh, Connor's one. Uh, did Kenny Florian win anything at 170? I'm not sure. Potentially, yeah. probably. Did Jared Cannonier win anything at heavyweight? Anthony Johnson, maybe? Yeah, probably. No. Well. Did he take any he, fights at middleweight? He did, but he missed weight for the Belfort yeah. fight by like 12 pounds and then lost yeah. anyway. Yeah, I forgot he lost that fight. Um, You know, Bantamweight is just in this interesting spot. I like Jimmy Rivera potentially, especially if, you know, they don't go that route with Marlon because Marlon or Marlon Vera, Marlon Vera, you know, just now jumping in at number 14. Obviously, these rankings are going to get shaken up a little bit, too. If you're just going to have a grappling delight, and I think if the UFC wanted to get interesting, how about he and Marab? If the UFC want if the UFC wanted to get cute, right? 
that's the fight you'd get cute with. That Frankie would... and Marab. And despite the fact, you know, Frankie is, uh, you know, from Jersey and Marab has been training at, at Sarah Longo, right there's there. no, yeah, I mean, there's there's no real conflict. No. That'd be interesting. I mean, I, I like Rivera. That's what came to me as I kind of sorted through the Bantamweight top 10 and was like, who's available? Makes sense, right? Yeah. Who's available that makes sense? I you know I I like uh, Jimmy Rivera, but if they if they wanted to do Marlon Vera, dude, Vera has earned a name. I agree, no doubt. Uh, like someone that's not Song Yadong too. You know what I'm saying? Like Song Yadong was the biggest name leading up to Sean O'Malley, right? And that's what yeah. you if you if you want to consider that a name, like I mean, maybe. Like what what I would consider Frankie Edgar perfect perfectly fitting for Marlon Vera. I think he's totally earned it. Uh, the flip side of this is Pedro Munoz. He, oh, I feel bad. I feel for him on this one. I mean, he came right out and said what you kind of said, or he's like, I think Edgar's name and reputation may have swayed the judges a little bit. Going into this, I mean, he'd lost four times in the UFC. They were all to top 10, if not top five Bantamweights. They were all decisions. Two of them were splitters. And except for his like UFC debut where Rafael Asensio pretty much ran him over, they were they've all been close. Like this dude has been so close, and he was just kind of bubbling along right underneath that logjam at the top of the man and weight division. Going into this, I mean, I, I'm not saying he looked past Edgar, but I'm sure he was thinking, if I can beat Edgar, that's a great name on my resume. And once all these Aljo and Yan and Marais guys sort themselves out, you know, I could get a title shot early next year. Instead. He gets this setback. What, who, who does he fight next? A fun fight, potentially, you know, you could pair him with whoever is on the lesser fortunate side of things of Marlon Marais and Corey Sandhagen. I think more realistically tuned up, though, and more realistically speaking, they'll probably tune him forward with a guy like a Cody Stamen. You know, the timetable isn't too far apart right you know Stamen fought Rivera I'm not sure how long ago but not terribly long ago um I feel like that could work out uh Munoz and Stamen I like all those what I want them to do is have him fight Jose Aldo I would like that fight a lot I mean they're they're both on back-to-back losses in the division but those losses don't really indicate how competitive they've been or how good they are right now no, and Aldo was competitive for a lot of the Jan fight um, up until, you know, Jan ended up putting his foot on the gas towards the end, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Aldo versus Marais, you know, like, was close enough that people disputed the decision. Yeah, depending I'm not on one who of, you I'm are. not one of them. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm not one of them, but he was that close to beating a top three guy. That yeah, there was even controversy about it. You and Keith both have your, you know— are both on on the on the Marlon Marais side of that fence, huh? I had it for Aldo, but I mean, I, I I'm not hollering one way or the other. Right, right, but you know, either way, he was right there with one of the top, like undisputed top three guys in the division. Totally. Uh, crazy thing is, it doesn't feel like it, but Munoz is actually two days older than Aldo. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But what what's Pedro? Thirty three. Yeah, they're they're both yeah. thirty three. They both th- turn thirty four at the beginning, like within a week or two. Like, yeah. beginning of September, they both turn 30. 34. Like, Aldo just, it feels like he should be, like, 38. With it how feels long like it's fighting. Just, yeah, and, like, the WEC kind of allure of the nostalgia side of things. It does feel like he should be older than 33 from that aspect. Awesome. A- any other uh, thoughts or shots on the on the headliner before we move on? If I sat in a judge's chair, I would have had it 48-47. I even understand Diamato's standpoint, who had it 49-46. Mm-hmm. Um, I almost had... Round five for Pedro as well, but it, I mean it, it. It was close either way. I could see it really either way. The yeah. only round I thought was definitive, cut and dry. Period was round two for Frankie. Right, and I, I'm I'm with you. I have it uh, 48, 47 Munoz with rounds two and five being the Edgar rounds. Three is a super swing round, and four and five could have gone either way as well. But three okay. is the one that I think is the most divisive. In the makeshift. You know, last minute promoted co-main event. Slow Mike yeah. Rodriguez uh, blew away Marcin Procneo. 
with a nice elbow strike and some follow-up punches at two minutes and 17 seconds of the first round. What is there to say about this other than this is one of the worst co-main events in modern UFC history? Probably ever, right? Like one of the worst co-main events ever. I mean, guys, came, these guys came in with a combined one and four UFC record. Yep. Um, Pracnio had been finished in his last two, now finished in all three. I don't First think he's made three. it out of the round of a round, yep. yeah, in any of them. Rodriguez put him away with elbows and punches. I think his prior two losses were what Sam Alvey, where he displayed phenomenal fight IQ. Um, <laughs> And just walked right into a right hand from hell. And, and then um, Magomed and Kalaev. And Kalaev, which, who, I mean, I mean no, no shame there. That but, guy's putting everybody away. He really should have put Paul Craig away, too. But I'm sure that fight still haunts him to this day. But, um, yeah, like, what do you say about this coming event? Rodriguez very likely could have saved his spot on the roster, though. I mean, you know, one and two going in, going into, you know, I think you and I touched on it a couple of weeks ago. That fa- that infamous fourth fight on your UFC contract, and you yes. get a win, you get some leverage. You know, you got to feel, you got to feel good for Mike Rodriguez, and you got to wonder if Pracnio is going to have another opportunity in the UFC. I agree. I wrote a matchmaking column for the losers on the main card, and I flat out said there's a very good chance that Pracnio is out of the UFC on the heels of his third straight first round loss, but the UFC's roster moves are more inscrutable and seemingly capricious than ever in the era of COVID just because they need bodies. I mean, obviously this got promoted to the co-main event because they needed bodies because particularly at two Oh five too, they'll need bodies. Right. So, I mean, there's a chance Procneo gets another shot. If so, let him and Ike be in the way of a fight. Um, really much else to say about this? I Yeah, we could do that. We could have those two guys fight. I, I mean, Rodriguez, I'm glad that he'll probably get a chance to stick around just because yeah. he lives by the sword, dies by the sword. Uh, you know, he is a big dude with, like, reach that creates kind of interesting – well, hell, he creates matchup problems for himself as well as his, his opponent sometimes. <laughs> but I, I, I'm here for it, you know? The, he's a powerful striker. He's rangy. He's good in close. He's really good in close quarters. Those elbows in the clinch are something we've seen out of him in other fights, too. You yep. know, in the Contender Series, he won by flying knee. He's really athletic. Um, yep. Yeah, fun guy to keep around at 205. Yeah, he's like a, a less insane, like, Johnny Walker, in, just in terms of, like, what parts of his body hit the other guy and how he gets to those positions. <laughs> uh, unorthodox is, is the charitable way to put it. Yeah, charitable. That's a good way. That's very good terminology. All right. Uh, moving down the card in the lightweight division, Austin Hubbard versus Joe Selecki. Uh, this was a grappling steamrolling that never even hit the canvas. Right. Selecki takes Hubbard's back standing, sinks the hooks, then gets the body triangle and just very calmly throws little pity pat strikes, looks for the choke. And once he had that thing locked in, uh, Hubbard was tapping quickly. I don't know if it was like on the jaw and just hurting him or he was just like, I'm done. But there didn't seem to be much of a struggle once he locked it up and started to cinch. What the body you- lock was key there, right? Like the body lock while he was standing up, it was key in keeping Hubbard in a compromised position. Selecki, though, I mean, how impressive – kind of on the face of things, is this win, particularly in the opening frame. I mean, Hubbard survived three frames against Davi Hamosh. He survived a whole lot of leg lock attempts from a very tricky guy. I know, like, all the whole corner thing happened with Roshkoff, but, you know, he survived all of those ground endeavors. And for Selecki to put him out in less than four minutes, you know, the way he did, it's pretty impressive. Extremely impressive. It was uh, a fantastic performance. Uh, Selecki just, yeah, you're, you're right in that the body lock was key because you could see Hubbard try to fight it a couple times with his hands and try to sneak a hand down. And as soon as he did, Selecki started attacking upstairs and Hubbard was like, oh, oh damn. And, you know, had to go back to fighting the hands again. Uh, really, what do you do with Selecki next? What's he, t- so two and oh in the UFC at this point, but at, I mean, 155. And 170, 
is there a reason that those are the two best divisions more than likely in MMA? Yes. I mean, that's the, the size of the normal human being, right? Like that are natural 155ers and 170 pounders. Um, but being 2-0 and in that division, there's something to say for it, whether Matt Wyman and Austin Hubbard are your two you know, opponents left in your weight. Didn't need the judges' scorecards in either of those fights. Um, you know, a couple of guys, you can gain some serious hype, especially in this division, by being 2-0, and 3-0 in the UFC. I mean, look at some of the guys that have 2-0 and records in this division, guys like, you know, Brad Riddell, guys like Marco Madsen, Kama Worthy. Uh, I mean, these are guys that posted 2-0 and records in this division. Uh, as far as what to do with them spinning it forward, you could do a lot of things. I mean, you have absolutely the pick of the litter um, as far as what to do with them next. You know, it just depends when you put on the matchmaker hat, what angle you want to take. Give him a guy coming off a loss. Give him another prospect kind of butting up. I mean, maybe – uh, a fight with an with another with another guy that's two and zero like an Omar Morales would make sense. I mean, what say you? If you put on your matchmaker hat, like what angle would you take? You know, I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, s- steal an idea from Brian Knapp, who writes nice. Sure Dogs matchmaking column for the winners. I write it for the the losers. Yeah. Uh, Roosevelt Roberts and Matt Frivola are fighting in a couple weeks. He said, "Winner of that." Nice. I like that. You know, so do I. They, they both have a little more experience in the UFC than Selecki, but neither of them has put together more than two wins in a row. So, right. you know, they're guys – they're in that pool that they're not in the top 10. They're not in the top 15. They're the guys that are kind of in that just big shark tank beneath that need to win three in a row to even be in the discussion about, you know, getting up to the, the next level. It's just such a long ladder at lightweight. Yeah, and, you know, let alone, like, back-to-back wins or, you know, pair two wins as impressive as Selecki has, you know, gone mm-hmm. about winning his. Mm-hmm. And But, I mean, Selecki's two wins uh, so far, they've been against Matt Wyman, who, you know, came back for two fights after five years and yeah. really just kind of looked out of sorts. And then uh, Hubbard, who I like Hubbard, but the jury is still out on whether he's UFC material. He's two and three right. in the UFC right now, and the two people he beat were immediately released. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I, I mean, Selecki has at least earned the right to try and beat someone who is undeniably UFC roster material. It's a fair point, and it's something that, you know, while, like you said, you can't hang your hat on a win like that for your resume necessarily, I think the way that Selecki won with particularly how Hubbard has defended himself in other fights, you know, I mean, if you're going to hang your hat in any regard, I would say that's the area to do it. Beautiful. Any other thoughts on this one before we uh, jump on to what I really want to talk about? Yeah, let's hit, let's get into what you really want to talk about. I want to talk about the flyweight main card attraction between Maria Agapova and Shauna Dobson, which is, again, just speaking strictly numerically, not in terms of narrative value or perception, the mm-hmm. biggest upset in UFC history. Okay. Uh, by the By the time it closed, Agapova was between minus 1,200 and minus 1,600 as a favorite. You can get Dobson at almost plus a thousand. <laughs> Dobson uh, drops the first round, although she had her moments there as well. Just tore it up in the second. Agapova had nothing left, and Dobson pounded her out uh, about a minute and a half into the second round. Were you surprised? I was surprised more so at the fact that it felt like Agapova, if you're looking at it from a video game analogy, right, like the the energy bar, per se, if you just like visualize it, it's just magically, it was just magically empty, like as soon as round two began, and I didn't see that coming per se, Um, but she was out of gas, like from the moment she got up off the stool, and I think that was more off-putting than... I mean, the result was, sure, especially given the numerical value, as you've put, that the odds carried. But it was more so surprising to me, like, oh, my gosh, she's out of gas. Oh, she's about to get finished. And then, like, oh, and it all just kind of happened, you know, in the better part the better part of just over a minute and a half. Really, that pretty much uh, sums it up. I have to think that – and I'm trying not to pile on Agapova – too badly here she's a 23 year old still a promising prospect but one the even the intro hype reel focused on her calling out dobson if you call out a three and four fighter you better win you better win but 
the way she fought her, there was just such disregard there because she didn't fight that way against Hannah Cyphers. Like against Dobson, I think she felt maybe pressure to get something spectacular in the first round because, I mean, not only did she blow her gas tank, she was just throwing wild stuff. Like she was yeah. out way over her feet. She was throwing kicks that were like off balance. I mean, Dobson sloppy. got her to the ground. Did basically you think just she was kind sloppy? Of incredibly sloppy just threw yeah. the entire kitchen sink at Dobson and Dobson got a takedown in the first round, basically just by kind of getting at her when she was throwing this off balance kick and shoving her to the, to the canvas. I think she expected to blow through Dobson, which is why she just threw all of her most spectacular looking techniques at her w- without much regard for strategy or pacing or anything and paid for it. It's a more severe version of what we saw happen to Edmund Shabazian a couple weeks ago. Just they're finally coming up against people that they do have to like put the pieces together and come up with something resembling a, a game plan. All right. You can't rely on, you know, past successes and, you know, prior endeavors that have that that have had less resistance in terms of paths to success like for example if you want to throw out Edmund as an example here's you know the good analogy to use you know Marshman he he disposed of him pretty quickly Charles Bird he was through him pretty quickly Agapova yeah she lost on the contender series to Cortez but Cortez is a good fighter and that fight was pretty competitive at, for at least a round or two uh, as far as I remember um you know, puts away Cyphers, and then this fight happens, and like you said, just kind of dumps it all out op- in the opening round. And Dobson put her in a, in a compromised position, and she just had nothing left. It, it you got to feel good for Dobson, but yeah, just wondering how uh, what the perception was at least, or what the perception of Dobson was rather at least from Agapova's standpoint heading into this fight. And it was weird just because she, like, she kept talking like they had some sort of personal beef. I don't understand it at all. I don't either you know? at all. Yeah, I'm like, with you. Where she's like, you know, quit running. I'm like, if you're nine and one and she's three and four, like, why should she have to run from you? You you shouldn't even be like talked about in the same sentence. Yeah. Uh, no. I'm off-putting. Gonna, yes, very off-putting. And again, only thing worse than calling out a f- sub 500 fighter is losing badly. <laughs> I am not going to say that I called this. Like, no, I, I, I didn't. I, I picked Agapova. I thought the odds were a little out of line. But I will say this. Even as I was mildly surprised she was still in the UFC, and hell, the only reason she's still in the UFC might be because uh, Maria Agapova wanted to fight her. But I've always looked at her like, you are a good, terrible fighter. Like, you... you like. I'm just saying she is physically like a strong and athletic <laughs> woman who, who has a good frame for flyweight. She has all the individual skills. She's a good grappler, good wrestler. It's not good her striker. first UFC finish. It's it, it's not her first UFC finish, but how can she – like my thought was always like why are you so terrible when you have all the individual skills? Like there, there's no excusing just getting blown up by Priscilla Cachoeira, who is one of the worst fighters in modern – UFC history yeah no inexcusable in that but some of her other losses you know you got a hand to her have come against you know like as far as technic technicalities I mean really high level fighters I mean I Sabina Mazo that's that's not an easy fight for a lot of people at 125 um but yeah I mean catch aware that that's a fight you got to capitalize on if you're in Shannon yeah. Dobson's shoes if you're going to capitalize on, yeah. on Agapova you've got to be able to do it against Priscilla Cash and not get stopped inside one round, right? We certainly hope not. Uh, <laughs> ready to move on down the uh, the main card? Yeah, when I, ready to move along at whatever pace. All right. Th- this is a fight that was made on Friday, like basically at the weigh-ins or immediately afterward, uh, finding themselves without their dance partners. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez and Dwight Grant decided to lock it up at uh, welterweight, saving a paycheck for both of them. And we had a contender for round of the year. In less than half a round, we just had wild swings of momentum uh, a minute in. It looked like Grant had Rodriguez in all sorts of trouble. And Rodriguez recovered as Grant's chasing him all around the cage, trying to finish. Then Rodriguez just 
clips him right on the chin. I think it was a, a short right hand as Grant was just swarming. Uh, and Rodriguez chases after Grant and uh, put him away. Like, Grant was on his knees. I think it was Rodriguez kind of like from a, a side ride that put him away. But uh, that was it. Fight stopped at two minutes and 24 seconds of the first round. Uh, again, a wild fight contender for round of the year. Any takeaways from this one? It played out largely the way I thought it was, but a lot faster and a lot <laughs> wilder. Like, uh, But it played out largely the way I thought it was. You know, Dwight Grant's reliance in this fight going into it was going to be a lot on his power. Um, and that's what he's relied on for most of his career is his power in his hands. And he's done well with said power in his hands. I think it's even led him, you know, indirectly as far as variables are concerned in some of the fights in in, in his past. Um, you know, I think it led him kind of indirectly to a split decision win over Alan Joban because, you know, that threat of the power was there and it led for Alan Joban to be a little bit hesitant. I thought that was potentially possible in this fight. Not at all what happened. Um, but as far as what did happen, apropos to what I believed was going to happen, was Rodriguez was going to rely on his precision while Grant was going to rely on his power. And I think you saw that with Rodriguez, he was able to use his, you know, his point precision. And I think something that he uses very well in aiding getting the finish like he's been able to do in most of his fights recently um, in which he's looked fantastic. I think what like now he's won six, seven in a row. Um, some, somewhere along there, he's been very, he's been very poised and collected whenever he's had guys hurt. And I think he showed, um, I think he showed that last night when he had Grant hurt, he was able to pick the shots, uh, wh where he needed to pick them in order to get the finish. Can't say it any better than that. And Rodriguez is on, in fact, a nine fight winning streak. Uh, he won on Dana White's contender series, didn't get the contract. He fought once more on the regionals, and then he's won three straight in the UFC since finally getting the call up. But yeah, uh, nine straight dating all the way back to December of 2017. So yeah, he, he's on a hell of a run. And we were just talking about how hard it is to separate yourself from the pack at lightweight or welterweight. Well, he, he is at welterweight where you can go on a five, six, seven uh, fight winning streak you know, before people start talking about you for the top 10, but he is, he's well on his way. I would say so. And he's looked damn impressive doing it. I mean, Tim means is, a, is not a bad feather to have in your cap. Dwight Grant is a dangerous guy. Um, I was excited to see the Sato fight. I picked Sato going into that fight. And now if they want to rebook that, I'd be more than will. I'd be more than happy to see that as well. And on, I am, I'm with you. I really wanted to see the Sato fight. That was uh, my sleeper pick for fight of the night. And I think Sato offered a little more refined version of what Grant brought, like a hard hitter, hard swinger, but maybe a little more precise than Grant. Hardcore but, you know, martial artist is what I kind of group Sato into. He's a hardcore martial artist because he's very you – know, like his technicalities are all there. Like he crosses his T's and dots his I's beautifully as a fighter. But man, is he dangerous too. Oh, yes. man, is he dangerous. All right. What we got? Lemos we and got, Mizuki? We got Mizuki versus Amanda Lemos in a fun strawweight fight. Uh, Lemos wins a unanimous decision, won all three rounds in the opinion of all three judges. But and, – and, and I think rightly so, but the individual rounds were all close. It's one of those where – yeah, it's 30-27, but when you look at that five years from now, unless you remember how the fight actually went, you, you know, you might get the wrong impression. It wasn't a complete steamrolling. She knocked her down in round one, and I think outside of that, there was no definitive moment. I thought when they read 30-27 across the board, I was a little surprised. But I thought the right girl won. Uh, and, you, you know, Mizuki did what she does in a lot of fights that she wins where she kind of gets the fight in her wheelhouse i.e the clinch i.e against the cage but like you know what did she do when the fight was there right well, not a whole lot and here's the question is that a sustainable way for her to win fights against ufc level straw weights in three round fights which is what she's gonna have for the foreseeable future it, it worked when she was in promotions where she 
didn't seem to be at a constant size and strength disadvantage. And wasn't fighting Verna Yandaroba, right? Like, I mean, yeah. it worked in Invicta. Like, it worked in Invicta. And and against girls that weren't going to be, you know, operating with a grapple-heavy mindset. Right. But it's, I mean, yeah, like you said, especially in a division that is stacked, especially for women's MMA standards. Mm-hmm. It, it's stacked, and it's stacked with a, a lot of, you know, women that just, she's not going to be able to bully him in, into the cage. No. I angry. mean, she had... She has a full range of offensive weapons, but she just defaults to, I want to mash you in the clinch. And once she gets you there, she doesn't throw a ton of strikes. Uh, She'll take the takedown if she can get it. But, I mean, if you're bigger and stronger than she is, she doesn't really have a lot of craft, uh, just a lot of finesse ways to get you down. Right. And for Lemos going forward, you've got to be concerned, at least from the standpoint that, you know, you used to fight like you, you you used to take the page out of the Andrade playbook, right? Like she first fought at 135 in the yep. UFC, lost to Leslie Smith, and since at 115, or at least in this fight, it, she, it felt like physicality was an issue for her. And when Inui was, or when Mizuki. In Mizuki Inui, I mean, I feel like everybody refers to her as just Mizuki, so I feel like if I call her Inui, like people aren't gonna know what I'm talking about. But um, I felt like she wanted the fight in a certain area, as like we said, and Lemos struggled to to neutralize that in a way, and I feel like that could be concerning for her going forward, especially in this division. Agreed. Any other uh, thoughts on this one? Lemos, you know, being 2-0 and in this division, she should get a big fight next. I don't know. Like, you know, they said on the broadcast it should be against a girl in the top 15. I don't know if I'd go that far. Maybe. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but we'll see. Yeah, I, it's a division where it, it is pretty deep, as you alluded, but there is a lot of value in being new because a lot of them have fought each other. And she put Miranda Granger to sleep in her last fight, right? Yep. Impressive yep. win. That's a yep. That's an impressive win. Impressive win, and one that I think will age well as uh, Granger gets back on the winning track Agreed. and starts beating people again. Agreed. Uh, Jordan Wright debuting in the UFC, a uh, weight class up from his usual weight class, weighed in at 200 pounds for a light heavyweight fight. <laughs> Doesn't make a difference. Takes him all of 91 seconds to put away Hurricane Ike Villanueva. Uh, he rocked uh, Villanueva with like this spinning wheel heel kick. Uh, I, you know, kind of goes stumbling, tumbling away. Beverly, he gets Hill, up. Beverly Hills Ninja, right? Yes. Beverly, the Beverly Hills Ninja. Uh, this was not a ninja move though. This was more of a, uh, classic Anderson Silva move. Just gets him, uh, in the clinch, hit, nails him with a bunch of knees. One of them splits Villanueva's face wide open. And that's all she wrote at a minute and a half. Uh, based on, what we on what limited uh, footage we saw on Saturday? Are you ready to uh, dub Jordan Wright the real deal? I mean, I mean, dub him the real deal. I don't know. Um, it was it was up a weight class from normal. Um, Villanueva is not your typical um, cream of the crop two hundred fiver. Um, however. You know, Wright's looked good in most of his career. I know it. I know. You know, when you scratch the surface of his of his sure dog or tapology record or whatever, you know, what may have you sure dog for the better part of this recording. Um, <laughs> J- Jordan Wright, um, it says he's undefeated. However, I mean, you know, we all most of us saw in the contender series, you know, his his shortcoming against Anthony Hernandez. Yes. However, you know, that cut kind of looked apropos. Shout out to, I think, Christian King was the one that tweeted this uh, during the broadcast. It was kind of the same looking cut that, you know, Holly and Paiva had last summer and on the Uruguay card when he fought Ro- Rogerio Bontarin. That cut that, like, was just a, a chunk of his face was missing, like, right above his eyebrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was a cut that when you looked at it, and he's like... You know they're going to stop the fight, especially if it got to a point where the doctor was welcomed inside the cage. Yeah, I, no surprise at all. And being the way we put on, you know, all the appearance of being frustrated that it was uh, over. Obviously, it sucks to lose on a cut, but a cut or no cut, those knees were were brutal. Like they're hellacious, no doubt. They were they were hellacious. I mean, there there was good 
valid question of whether he would have made it out of the round, cut or no cut. And ultimately, cuts like that are are what he's going to need to deal with. Uh, You know, I've been face-to-face with Ike Villanueva a lot of times. He's got a lot of scar tissue, you know, and guys like that, not only do they cut pretty easily, but when they cut, the cut is big because you've got hard you know, hardened tissue that just splits wide open and it's going to split wide open every time. It's, you know, what Nick Diaz had to deal with, what Fedor Emelianenko had to deal with, uh, just to name a couple of guys that really I probably have never never been mentioned in the same breath as I could be in the way of it before. No. Uh, <laughs> but, I, yeah, I'm excited to see uh, Jordan Wright going forward in his proper weight class. Uh, yeah, see if he learned from the fight against Hernandez, right? Like, and gets... You know, because I think talent-wise and as far as technical proficiencies are concerned, you know, he's there. Agreed. Agreed. And he's in a division that, it, speaking of middleweight, not light heavyweight, that desperately needs new contenders. It's aging. Yeah. Thin. It, it, it needs them. No doubt. All right. We are down to the first two fights of the evening, which I did not watch. Did you? Did you not see the first fight? I didn't. I caught like highlights really? and I got the the narrative of what happened. Oh man! The, so yeah. the second fight was was pretty dominant, right? Semmelsberger beats Carlton minus a fight yeah. that I got wrong. I liked Carlton minus's upside going into it. That was pretty much domination. Matthew Semmelsberger looked good, dude. The first fight though, wow! I mean, wow! Valiev had Trevin jo- so Va- so you didn't watch it at, at all live. You just caught a couple of things and uh, and someone yeah. gave you the narrative of what happened. Well, I, I locked in halfway through Semmelsberger and Minus, and I was working the rest of the night, so yeah. I mean, you want to talk about – I'm not going to go Pat Barry versus Chet Congo. I'm not going to go that route, but I'm going to say you know, Jones was badly – Trevin Jones was badly, badly hurt. Um, with the kick to the, there was a front kick to the body. It was a piercing front kick to the body. I'm watching this. I wasn't home yet either. I'm watching this off work right and i didn't cover this card last night i had this weekend off because i knew i had to work most of yesterday morning and i get off i'm watching this at the bar no sound no commentary and i and valiev coming into this fight too you know he had a changing of opponent he is i think it he closed it like what minus 550 yep. minus 600 valiev is a really talented fighter you saw a lot of the guys from the dagestani you know kind of a lot allegiance tweet about him going into the card, you know, yep. Islam Makachev. I mean, this is a guy that came into this weekend with a lot of hype and rightfully so he hurts Jones early, almost put him out. I mean, it was a miracle that he survived and he does survive and then clips him with a beautiful right hook, uh, about a minute and a half into the second finished and was able to finish him with ground and pound. It was absolutely tremendous. Uh, Trevin Jones, though, was a guy that I thought was a more difficult fight for Valiev than the one that he was originally booked. So, I mean, props to both guys, especially Jones getting $50,000 for performance of the night. That is fantastic. And y- you would not have suspected that that would not be the biggest upset of the evening w- when it happened. But, would have never. Would have yeah. never. Yeah, and, you know... Uh, Valiev is someone that even back when he was in uh, PFL and World Series of Fighting, I was like, this is a guy we'll see in the UFC at some point and, you know, could do some damage there. I have to watch the fight, but my my thought is he still is. Like, yeah. he's a really good fighter. Anyone can get caught. So I, I will have to, like, rewatch this in its entirety. Yeah, no, I highly, highly suggest it. It is not a waste of your time by any stretch. Fantastic. With that, you have the entire nine-fight card of UFC on ESPN 15, UFC Vegas 312.5, UFC on ESPN uh, plus 950. It'll be uh, UFC on ESPN plus 950, just like Shauna Dobson. (laughs) Plus Uh, 950, that's a good one. Yeah, so let's uh, move on to the cut list. Yeah. Uh, The cut list. Each of us think, can name one or more fighters who we believe should be cut from the UFC. We're not trying to be mean. Just fighters being cut is the way room is made for more fighters to join the organization. Sometimes we're mean, but it doesn't yeah. have to be. If both of us agree, they are on the cut list. Do you have anyone for the cut list, Davidson Baker? 
I mean, you know, there's one surefire entry, right? And then I think there's one guy that's kind of on the fringe. And the one surefire entry has got to be Pracneo, right? I'm with you on that. Pracneo is, I mean, again, we, we've been through it, but he's lost three straight by first round TKO. Yeah. You know, like that's about as definitive as you can get. No doubt. And Villanueva, I think, is kind of on that teeter-totter kind of, you know, maybe he takes a short notice fight, and especially in the weight class that he's in, uh, it may benefit him. Yeah, I mean, obviously my personal kind of sentimentality and bias is going to move in there. Uh, obvious that, that he could be cut and there'd be no complaint from a competitive standpoint. If you want to make a case for him, while he is 0-2, one of them was a cut in 90 seconds and the other was stepping up at heavyweight on five days notice. Right, so you yeah. can make the argument that he hasn't really had a chance to show what he can do yet. But at best, as much as I like Villanueva and congratulations, Ike on the birth of your daughter this past weekend. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, th- this may be the ceiling, you know, just the chance to maybe prove that he was UFC level for a minute. Th- this might've been it. Who knows if the UFC decides to keep them both around, let them fight each other. But yeah, I- I'm, I'm with you. You know, uh, Procneo has got to go and speaking competitively, you know, this might be it for being the way as well. We shall see. We shall see. We will now move on to the bulls and the bears bulls and bears, of course, is a stock market reference. Uh, bulls means that their stock is going up. Things are booming. Bear means that, uh, the stock is going down. It's uh, not not a good time uh, for for their market value. They can be people, places, things. Each of us can name up to three of them. Uh, Davidson, would you like to do the Bulls or the Bears first? We'll do the Bulls first. Bulls first. And you want to go first or you want me to go first? You can kick off the Bulls. I'll kick off the Bears. Okay. Uh, Bulls. Uh, my number three bull is going to be Frankie Edgar, regardless of how you feel about the decision. And again, it is a a controversial one. Frankie Edgar now has a win in his third weight class. He is probably going to become a top 10, uh, fighter in his third weight class in just about every set of rankings that matters this week. That is an incredible thing to be able to say. And through it all, uh, he's been pretty much the picture of class in and out of the cage. The sport couldn't ask for a better ambassador, and he feels like more than an ambassador. He feels like still a a contender, possible champion. That you know he, he's he's been here the the whole time. So good days for him. Uh, Joe Selecki is going to be my number two bull. Austin Hubbard came into this fight two and two in the UFC, but his losses had been fairly competitive decisions to good fighters. Debbie Hamosh, Marco Madsen, good fighters. Uh, Joe Selecki just completely blanked him. It was a statement win. He looked great. And in a division where it is kind of hard to stamp your passport to the the next level and take on fighters on the next level, uh, he may have done that. So, just the the very definition uh, of a uh, bull market for him. Uh, wow. Number one, going to be Shauna Dobson. I mean, who else could it be than somebody who walked into the cage as a 10 to one underdog and just, I mean, I'm not going to say shock the world because this wasn't, like Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey. It's not like the world was watching, but yeah. you know, shocked a couple hundred thousand people. And the thing is just stood right up to her. Even the first round that Agapova won, Dobson had her in some trouble and she was right there with her. So uh, for a woman who definitely saved her, uh, her spot on the UFC roster with that win uh, and, you know, maybe turn some heads, you know, good for her. Maybe she translates this into being instead of, a terrible fighter who should be good into just flat out being a good fighter in the UFC. Do you have any bulls? I do. Um, my three would be Frankie for a lot of the reasons that you said. Um, um, Shana Dobson is going to be two for me. Um, you know, there's a lot to make and a lot to bring out of beating a girl that was as, you know, heavily heavy, heavy of a favorite that Maria Agapova was. 
But, you know, I'm going to go with my number one bull as someone you omitted from your list, potentially. I think Daniel Rodriguez could be someone that it ends up becoming a problem at 170 by the end of the year. You know, he and Yusuf Zalal might be in a race to see who has more wins by the end of their rookie year. Uh, Zalal's booked for another fight right now and could be 4-0 by the time you and I potentially even do this again. Um, uh, Daniel Rodriguez at 3-0 and now. See if he holds up par with him. He's right behind him. But I think his stock is soaring big time. Beautiful. That That's a great one. Uh, do you have any bears? Um, You know, I got a couple. I, I mean, Pracnio obviously would be one, but... Agapova has to be the biggest one. Um, I think just let it all out, and whether it's adrenaline dump or what may have you, just a really shocking and off-putting display in round two, and it led to her demise and an ultimate loss. Um, one would believe that she'll be up, bounce back, but, I mean, what other way but down goes her stock after Saturday? That's uh, – could, couldn't agree more. Uh, is that it for your Bears? Okay, uh, I've got two bears. One of them is Pedro Munoz through really no fault of his own because Pedro Munoz as a fighter is the exact same dude he was when he woke up Saturday morning, but the next year of his professional life looks so different than it did. Just, you know, there is that kind of weird log jam at the top of his division that's going to sort itself out, and he went from being, like, the next guy to kind of step in and get a shot after they all fought each other to who knows how far back because Frankie Edgar is the kind of guy that the UFC was looking for any excuse to fast track to the front of the queue. He's now given them that. So unfortunate thing, you know, Munoz fought well. A lot of people thought he won the fight, but he just took a big step back. You would think the UFC maybe match makes it with that in mind. Potentially they have in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe, but that's a big, maybe. And then my number one would be uh, Agapova as well. Who else could it possibly be? And again, she's not ruined goods. She's not all hype. She's a very good fighter. She's beaten some good fighters, but she definitely has to go back to the drawing board. Uh, She's not going to win many of her fights fighting the way she fought Dobson, you know, very much. And again, I already made the comparison, but very much the same way Edmund Shabazian. He's still got skills, but he can't, he's never going to get, you know, a, a title shot at middleweight fighting the way he's been fighting. He needs to retool. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, overall letter grade for uh, this card. I'm going to give it a solid B. You know, the name the name and face value is so pitiful, and I think the co-main event obviously screams that. And the cancellations, I mean, what do you have on um, – on topology, as far as fights that were canceled and or restructured, fizzled, what may have you, 11. That's staggering. That is staggering, especially, I mean, like half of them happened during fight week and two of them happened on the day of weigh-ins. Just, yeah, and one was just, you know, one of a guy being deemed unfit to compete, right? Which, I mean, you have to wonder what that was. You know, you have to. Uh, it may be a commission thing, maybe, I, who knows? Yeah, I'm going to give this one a B minus. Maybe I'd give it a B if I had seen uh, the first two fights in their entirety. Yeah. But there was some great stuff. I mean, a huge upset, always interesting to witness. The decision in the main event left a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth. But ultimately, south of the main event, this was an LFA card. You know, and for, <laughs> me, for me to block out a UFC t- size time slot in my weekend to catch what on – Talent is uh, an LFA card, you know, I don't love. But, hey, we also got a standing rear naked choke, which is always fun to see. I, th- I thought it was a main event with eight prelims, and I thought the main event was not the best fight of the weekend. I thought the best fight of the weekend was the Bellator main event. Oh, dude. Yeah. All I know is I want Kerry Hatley cloned and three copies of him sent to every major event forever. Like Do you that, want him to ref some more? That is how you ref a title fight. I, I loved it. Yeah, people the, are outraged with him, man. Yeah, people can, can bite me. Like, <laughs> I didn't think the stoppage was terrible. I thought it, I thought could could it have been stopped earlier? Yeah, but like you said, I mean, we're talking about the parameters of a title fight and I mean I'm not outraged by the stoppage. I'm not. I'm I'm pleasantly outraged you, by yeah, the stoppage. Yeah, I was about to say you seem to be perfectly fine with it. 
Yeah, well, and, you know, I I spend my weekends uh, watching uh, these events, you know, at least virtually speaking, with Sherdog editor in chief Mike. Yeah. Just you know, if he dies, he dies, Fridley. So I, some of that probably <laughs> like rubs off on me. <laughs> but all right, awesome. that is it. I, a truncated card gets you a truncated breakdown. Uh, but I have been Ben Duffy of Sherdog.com. This has been Davidson Baker. Dave, tell people uh, how and where and why they should find you. At Dave Bake MMA, we got lots of breakdowns coming out this week. Contender series, always. MMA, uh, loud, loud mouth MMA, UFC breakdown, always. It's at Dave Bake MMA. That's where you can find it all. Outstanding. When am I going to guest on some of your shit, man? Yeah, I mean, you guessed it on my podcast a few weeks ago. That's true. Um, um, dude, I'm always down. You know, I'm always down to guest on whatever you have or whatever you offer to me to. I'm going to work another one of these stupid doubles tomorrow, too, like I worked yesterday. So it's going to make my Contender Series preview kind of difficult. But, I mean, I already have everything, like as far as my ducks in a row. Like I already have all, all the tape break, broken down. So it should be a good one. Look out for that. Uh, and look out for plenty more, both on the Sure Dog Radio Network and the Loud Mouth MMA Podcast Network. Thanks and good evening. 